Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Harris, and I'm a PhD prepared nurse and postdoctoral fellow at Duke University in the Durham VA. And I'm also a REC scholar at the Duke UNC ADRC. Uh, I'm very excited to have been invited to speak on a topic that I'm very passionate about, which is the mental and social wellness continuum and stress and dementia. And just briefly about my uh, background as a clinician, I have experience as an inpatient geriatric psych nurse working with older adults with a number of different mental health conditions, many of whom also had co-occurring diagnoses of dementia. So today we'll be first starting off by conceptualizing a mental and social wellness continuum. And then I'll move into talking about the theory of the aging paradox and talk about strengths and vulnerabilities that we associate with aging. I'll start with a more traditional understanding of mental health. Um, so when we think about a patient or a person, they may be living a normal, healthy, functioning life. And in terms of their mental health, they may be having some normal mood fluctuations. They're performing consistently in their daily roles, whether that be professionally or at home. They may be sleeping normally, uh, but they may also be, or they may have uh, be comfortable in the situations that they're living in. They're physically and socially able to uh, participate in the activities that they're wanting to participate in. And then we may be thinking about somebody as they're kind of moving along this continuum. Uh, they may be reacting to the world around them, which is totally normal. So they're having common but reversible uh, levels of stress or increases in stress. They may have some irritability, sadness, uh, increasing worry or forgetfulness, lower energy levels. They may have difficulty relaxing and they may be choosing not to participate so much socially or they're not able to participate as much socially as they once were. And then we think about people who are people who are in more of an injured state. Uh, these are the types of people that we may be seeing as clinicians and healthcare providers. Uh, these people may have some significant functional impairment, so they may describe feeling more angry or anxious, having some symptoms of depression. Uh, they may be increasingly worried, have decreased performance at work, or have difficulty sleeping. They may be with withdrawing or avoiding certain situations, uh, specifically social situations. And then we think about people who are more of in this illness state, and these are the types of patients that I've cared for in the inpatient geriatric psych setting. So these people have clinical disorders, uh, severe and persistent functional impairments. So they may have uh, difficulty managing emotions, which results in things like panic attacks or angry outbursts. They may constantly be feeling overwhelmed or have constant fatigue. They may be having hallucinations or delusions because their perception is disturbed, and they may be increasingly think about, thinking about suicide or having suicidal intentions or behaviors. Typically, we think that people who are in the community, they're not receiving support for their mental health from a healthcare provider. They're doing their self-care at home and really reaching out for social support on their own. Those types of people are typically in the uh, healthy and reacting stages of this continuum. And then as healthcare providers, we're typically seeing people who are in the injured or illness state. As I said, this is a pretty typical or traditional conceptualization of mental health. It's very common in nursing, very common with the medical model and thinking about health. I do want to highlight this definition as we begin to think a little bit differently about mental health and aging. Mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. I just want you to take a minute and think about the things that you're not seeing in this definition compared to this model. We're not seeing any discussion of injury. We're not seeing any discussion of illness. It's very much focused on well-being, realizing one's own abilities, and making a contribution. Some components of mental well-being, if we're thinking a little bit differently than mental health, are emotional well-being. So the transient emotions that we have in our daily life, feelings of happiness, satisfaction, and interest in life. Psychological well-being is another component of mental well-being. So self-acceptance, having a purpose in life, being able to do things independently, having positive relationships with others, being a master of our environment, uh, being able to achieve personal growth and think about personal growth. 
And then there's several different factors that play into our social well-being. And I'll say that social well-being, we sometimes think about differently than mental well-being. But in this conceptualization of well-being, it's it certainly is a part of our mental well-being. It's not its own separate concept. How can we combine this concept of mental well-being with the more traditional concept of mental health and mental illness? And I'd like to propose this to continue a model of mental illness and mental well-being. So a person may be anywhere along these different these two continuums. So they may be in, op in an optimal well-being state with minimal mental illness. And this is considered the ideal state where the person has a high sense of well-being and no mental illness. They may also have a subjective state of low sense of well-being, although they don't have a mental health disorder. So on this day, somebody may be saying, I feel mentally unwell, but I do not have a mental illness. And then the bottom left quadrant, we would say, is the lowest level of functioning. This is typically where people are at when we see them in an inpatient or hospital setting receiving some sort of mental health care. So at, they're at their lowest level of functioning, and they feel that they're mentally unwell, and they also have significant mental illness. And then the I think the most interesting quadrant for me is the one where people identify that they have a mental illness, but they still have this high sense of subjective well-being. So how can we push them from this lower left quadrant and help them to move into this top left quadrant where they still have mental illness, but they say, you know what, on this day, I feel good. Um, okay, that's, I think, probably the most interesting quadrant to think about. So just as an example, we can think about somebody who has a past experience um, with being diagnosed with PTSD. They're very aware that they have the PTSD. Um, on this particular day, they say, you know what, my PTSD, I haven't experienced any sort of trigger. I haven't, I'm in a very calm environment. I'm comfortable with the job that I'm in. I'm happy with the relationships in my life. On this day, even though I have PTSD, I'm feeling pretty good. And so they're in this top left quadrant of this to continue a model. Maybe a week later, they experienced some disruption in their daily life. Maybe they had a bad day at work. Maybe they lost a family member or friend. Maybe they experienced something that reminded them of what the trauma was that they originally endured. And on this day, they say, you know what? I'm feeling my PTSD, but even more so, I just feel mentally unwell. And that's where they're in this bottom left quadrant. And I think as researchers, certainly as researchers and also clinicians, we like to see consistency. We like people consistently being kind of in the top half of this two-part, two-continuum model of mental illness and mental well-being. But this is where most of us are. Um, we travel across all of these quadrants. Uh, some days we feel like even if we haven't been formally diagnosed, that we do have anxiety. Some days we feel worse than others. And this is very typical. We don't always see consistency in mental illness and mental health. It's, it happens across the board, and we need to recognize as clinicians, even though we like consistency and we like to see it, it is not uncommon or necessarily a problem if we're seeing these fluctuations over time. And I just want to say that this to continue a model is something that you could think about when thinking about care for patients. Um, you may also present this as a tool for patients to be able to map where they are on a daily basis and how their mental well-being and mental illness might fluctuate. Um, so this could be a tool for you in thinking and conceptualizing mental health. It may be a helpful tool for patients as well. But importantly, we do need to be thinking about mental well-being in addition to mental illness. So assessing for mental illness is not enough. We should also be assessing for mental wellness. There are few clinical tools that have been created to really measure this very multidimensional concept of mental well-being, um, particularly for older adults. There's a lot fewer tools out there to measure this concept in older adults compared to younger adults. And importantly, no assessment tools have been created specifically for the oldest of old population, um, and that is a limitation in this area. However, I did want to provide a few different ideas. So the Soda Life Satisfaction Late Life Scale was designed specifically for older adults. Um, it's a 14-item scale. The WHO 5 Wellbeing uh, measure, it, it's designed for um, 
adults of all ages, not specifically for older adults, as well as the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. And I know everybody is busy and we're assessing so many different things in the patients that we care for. So I'm not a supporter of saying you need to incorporate all of these items into your assessment, but it may be worth it to look at some of these different scales and look at the concepts that they're measuring and decide if there's one or two items that you could include in your assessment to not only look at mental illness, but also look at mental wellness and think about that to continue a model. I now want to talk about some of the things that we think about when we think about aging adults. So for aging adults, we know that they experience a loss in muscle mass and strength. They experience declines in their um, flexibility and their ability to move about. They experience uh, difficulties with their vision, lowered visual acuity. Also, they have impaired hearing as we get older, it happens naturally. And we know that older adults also experience changes in their cognitive processing, and they may be experiencing memory-related concerns, even if they don't have a diagnosis of dementia or formal cognitive impairment. But I want to highlight in the final one here is that older adults also tend to have a shrinking of their social network, so they have fewer social ties and relationships as they did when they were younger. But despite all of these losses, older adults still report higher degrees of life satisfaction. They report more positive emotions and fewer negative emotions than younger people. They actually report having stronger social ties, even though their social networks are shrinking. And they experience a higher or tend to report higher levels of mental well being. So despite all the losses, there's still all of these positives that are happening and people who are older still continue to report higher senses of sense of uh, mental well-being compared to younger people. And this is called the aging paradox. And it's a paradox because it's not what we would typically think that when all these losses are happening, that all of these positives are happening as well. To extend the aging paradox and to think about why that might be happening, uh, we can think about how as we age, um, as people age, they tend to really focus on the things that matter most. So they're selecting areas in their life, they're selecting environments, uh, routines, um, people that they surround themselves with that are most important and really optimizing those. So even though they may be experiencing, um, I would say, less variability in their days, um, their days are not as spontaneous, they have more routines, they may have smaller social networks, they're seeing people less often, but this means that they, the times that they do see people, the times that they are in certain situations, they can really optimize those and make the most of them, especially in their daily life routines. So with fewer social roles, this also means fewer stressors. Most of our stressors relate to how we interact and respond to others. So when you have fewer uh, social responsibility, that means that you're really lowering your potential for stress. Lower cognitive functioning means less processing. So there's less work being done to process the situation, um, even though we have this lower cognitive function. And with physiologic decline, we know that this can actually promote emotional regulation. More energy can be spent on regulating emotion. And again, with smaller social networks, we often have higher levels of relationship closeness. And this is, these are theories, or these are why the aging paradox might exist. This is what the research shows us. And I'll say that consistently over decades, the research has consistently shown that the aging paradox exists. And I would say this isn't intuitive for all clinicians because we often focus on the losses. But the science says that we should really be focusing on the strengths because they're there. It's our job to leverage them. So thinking about the strengths of aging, uh, with age comes experience and self-knowledge of really understanding what is going to shoot up my stress level, what types of situations being around, what types of people is really going to keep me at my calm. That happens as we age. Avoiding exposure to negative experiences really does reduce emotional distress. And selecting positive environments and routines can improve emotional well-being. And again, stronger social connections, although fewer, optimizes social wellness. 
I want to move into talking about stress. Uh, this is a another topic that I'm just very passionate about. Um, we all experience stress, and this model presented in this um, slide is somebody's stress experience could be anybody's stress experience, not necessarily an older adult or somebody living with dementia, but we all have a certain perception of stress in our environment and things that are happening around us. And typically our perception of stress kind of goes up and down throughout the day, throughout our life. Uh, we might be any, maybe anywhere along the spectrum. We all also have a stress threshold. So the amount of stress that we can tolerate until we are in this distressed phase and are displaying or experience some sort of more negative emotion or more negative response to the stress that we're experiencing because we're all experiencing stress at all the time, at all times. Uh, so for me, I know that my most stressful stimuli is when I think or when I know that I'm going to be late for something. It doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's just for coffee with a friend, I get extremely stressed when I know that I'm going to be late. So that will instantly shoot up my perception of stress. I typically exceed my stress threshold, and I just feel bad for the people around me who have to bear witness to that. So I like to show up very early for everything. Um, often at the expense of others who are with me because they also have to arrive very early. But I know that that's what keeps me in my calm state and keeps me out of this anxious and distressed state. Um, so just thinking about the perception of stress, it's very person dependent. It's very dependent on one's environment. It's dependent on how they were, um, how they grew up, how they were raised. It's dependent on the context in which they're um, living in. And we have to think about all of that. So uh, when we think about somebody's perception or experience with stress, it really revolves a more holistic view of who they are as people and their environment in which they live. So some interesting things happen as people get older in terms of their stress and the stress that they experience. And as you can see here, even at the start of the day, uh, people who are older tend to have a heightened perception of stress. So their stress experience is already higher than it was uh, when they were younger. In addition, uh, they have this prolonged reactivity period, which means that after they've reached a distressed state, it's harder for them to get down back into an anxious or calm state. So although um, there are things that we can do, older adults tend to do, that keeps them from reaching that distress state, like optimizing their environment and their social roles and relationships. Uh, if they do reach that distress state, they sometimes have more difficulty coming back down. But again, this is all very person dependent. Um, so it depends on a person's uh, really daily life, daily routine, and, and their context in which they live. Um, but this is just typically what the research has showed, how the stress threshold differs for older adults. And now we can look at the threshold for people who are living with dementia. Again, we have this heightened perception of stress, which is typical for aging adults. We have the prolonged reactivity period. Most interestingly, though, is this decreased stress threshold. So throughout the day, somebody's threshold or ability to tolerate stress when they're living with dementia actually continues to go down. And that's the theory behind why sundowning happens. So we think about sundowning and how people later in the evening, afternoon time tend to experience more agitation, more frustration. And it's because their thresh thresh stress threshold has been declining throughout the day. So they're able to more easily reach a distressed state. They have this prolonged reactivity that keeps them there. And they have this decreased stress threshold. So instead of being able to come back down into a more anxious state, they remain in that distress state for even longer. And this model was developed uh, by neuroscientists, and it was designed to really understand why we were seeing so many symptoms of dementia. So things like agitation and anxiety, restlessness, um, sleep disturbances. Why were these symptoms so prominent in dementia? And this model has been used to educate family caregivers uh, to better understand what the person living with dementia was experiencing and why we see so many of those symptoms occurring. And I think it's helpful to kind of come into thinking about stress and dementia with this model uh, to recognize that it's not necessarily all related to the cognitive impairment. It's really related to stress more broadly. It's related to the psychological and mental aspects of the person's health and not solely cognitive impairment or memory. 
Again, my name is Melissa Harris. You can reach out to me at any time regarding content related to this presentation. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I have included some references, and if you would like these slides, please just reach out.